The site of Star Car in England is known as a textbook example of the ancient Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age period. The site layers have been dated around 9300 BC through about 8500 BC during those centuries shortly after the end of the last major ice age of the Pleistocene. Starkar has been among the world's most famous archaeological sites, largely because of the excellent preservation of a particular time period that otherwise has been represented only scarcely. In this case, Starkar has offered invaluable insights into ancient Mesolithic life. This video guides through the basic facts about Starkar that you might encounter in a textbook or in a museum exhibit. The goal here is for you to build your own ideas and interpretations. Based on the material contents that have been preserved at Star Car, the site has prompted new ways of thinking about how ancient people transitioned between the Ice Age of the Pleistocene and the next post-glacial conditions of the Holocene. In a worldwide view, the archaeological records of the Ice Age or Pleistocene have reflected various hunting-gathering lifestyles. During the next period of the Holocene, sedentary communities began to emerge, often with farming as the major component of their economic life and patterns of engaging with their landscapes. This overall difference has been understood as a transition in lifestyle from a Paleolithic or Old Stone Age to a Neolithic or New Stone Age context. The exact timing and details of this transition have been variable from one geographic region to another. One such transition has been preserved at the site of Star Car during the centuries before and after about 9000 BC. In this particular case, the transitional period was preserved underneath a peat bog, and the many material findings here have supported notions of a Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age context. At the time when Graham Clark conducted the first formal excavations at Star Car around 1949 through 1951, he interpreted the hunting gathering site as somewhat different from the older hunter-gatherer sites of the last Ice Age or Pleistocene. Specifically, the house ruins and midden deposits clearly were more substantial than seen in the older sites of Ice Age hunter-gatherers who lived in small groups at limited camps and moved seasonally from one small campsite to another. Nonetheless, the evidence at Star Car did not reflect a large, sedentary community living year-round in a village setting or with a formalized system of farming or other land use practice. Rather, the findings at Star Car matched with notions of a transitional period between the older Paleolithic hunter-gatherer contexts and the later Neolithic farming contexts. In this case, Graham Clark proposed that Star Car offered a rare glimpse into the otherwise poorly known Mesolithic context. Since the 1950s, several investigators and teams have worked at Star Car. Web links and references are provided in the video description. Throughout these decades of research, the discipline of archaeology has grown with new conceptual frameworks and technical procedures. New ideas have developed about how to conceptualize the Mesolithic context. New techniques have become available in radiocarbon dating, assessment of ancient geological conditions, recovery of tiny and sometimes microscopic particles, and analysis of preserved animal and plant remains. Given these advancements, the textbook examples and museum exhibits about Star Car have transformed over the last several decades, and new discoveries may yet occur. Today, Star Car is situated in a lowland valley, about 8 to 10 kilometers from the east coast of England. Going back in time, though, around 9000 BC, this location was at the edge of a large inland lake. 
The ancient setting of the site can be understood by clarifying its dating in the context of the changing environment after the last ice age. The site first was used around 9300 BC and then activities continued here through about 8500 BC. This timing was some centuries after the end of the last ice age when many of the glaciers and ice sheets of northern Europe already had melted. In this context, the melting and movement of an ancient glacier caused scarring in the ground that became a large lake. Later, the lake became infilled with more recent sediments and the area supported the formation of a peat bog. The peat bog effectively sealed the ancient archaeological layers beneath it. The stable and anaerobic conditions enabled exceptional preservation of the archaeological materials, even after several thousands of years. From those preserved ancient deposits, the botanical remains have depicted a setting with reeds, water lilies, and other aquatic plants at the edge of the Paleo Lake. In the nearby elevated terrain, the forest composition included trees of birch, aspen, and willow. The Paleo Lake likely was a natural habitat for various waterfowl and perhaps different freshwater fish and shellfish. The nearby woodland could have supported numerous other animals, likely with seasonal differences in their locations and ranges. Curiously, at this site, fish bones and bird bones were extremely rare. One special discovery, however, was a bead or pendant made from a large bird bone. The animal bones from the site excavations have been identified mostly as belonging to mammals. The represented herbivores were beavers, red deer, roe deer, elks, aurochs, boars, and hares. The represented carnivores were wolves, lynx, bears, fox, pine martens, badgers, and hedgehogs. All of those animals notably lived naturally in the wilderness. The only hint of a domesticated species has been in the findings of bones most likely from dogs. In other geographic regions, dogs already had been domesticated and separated from their natural wolf ancestors some thousands of years earlier. Therefore, domesticated dogs may have accompanied the hunter-gatherer communities at Starkar. The preserved artifacts were diverse. Among the preserved wood items, one piece resembled a paddle of a canoe suitable for the Paleo Lake habitat. Another piece resembled a harpoon point made with an attachment hole for a sinew or another fiber that would enable a person to haul back whatever animal had been targeted. Antlers of elks were fashioned into diverse shapes. Some of these items may have been articulated with handles used as tools for digging in the ground or other purposes. Additional items may have been parts of house structures, boats, or other constructions. Stone tools were numerous at this site, especially using varieties of flint that could be flaked in predictable patterns and produce sharp edges. The larger stone tools appeared to be axes or adzes used for heavy work such as for the felling of trees or for the fashioning of the larger pieces of boats, houses, and other large woodwork constructions. The smaller stone tools appeared to be cutting or slicing points. Some may have been handheld tools, but many others likely were attached with handles in composite tools. Additional tools were made from the antlers of red deer. These objects included various shapes and sizes of barbed points. The barbed edges would have become lodged inside a targeted animal. Of course, not all of the artifacts were practical tools. Many of the items reflected artistic, decorative, or perhaps ritual aspects of ancient life at Starkar. 
For instance, one pendant, or possibly a bead segment, was made from a bird bone. Other pendants and beads were made of amber. This amber material most likely had been imported from somewhere in southern Scandinavia, where amber occurred naturally and had been fashioned into diverse artifacts. Among the more fascinating discoveries at Starkar have been the sets of small stone beads made from pieces of shale. The shale was cut, shaped, and polished. A few rare pieces were incised or engraved. One unique piece was decorated with a complex etching design that could be interpreted in numerous ways. Another set of remarkable artifacts included frontlets made from modified skull caps of red deer stags, with the antlers still attached. The bone portions were drilled with two holes, possibly for people to wear the frontlets as headgear. Additionally, the antler portions had been trimmed, possibly for reducing the overall weight of the frontlets. Similar frontlets have been identified in many parts of the world and throughout many time periods. In some cases, they have been used by hunters. In other cases, they have been used by shamans or other people during ritual performance. Possibly both of those contexts could have occurred at Starkar. One key part of the site was indicated by a cluster of 18 post molds inside a slightly depressed or sunken area measured about 3 meters to 4 meters in width. The post molds likely related to a single hut or small house structure, although the house may have been remodeled a number of times. The depressed or sunken area had been filled with layers of moss, reeds, and other plant materials. Furthermore, this area contained a high density of burned residues, stone tools, and other evidence of intensive use of a concentrated area. In another part of the site, cut timbers were found at the edge of the Paleo Lake. Logs of aspen trees and willow trees had been split lengthwise, probably by using a wedge driven into the end of each log. The timbers may have been used for making an artificial platform at the water's edge. Overall, the material evidence at Starkar has depicted what happened here at the edge of a Paleo Lake, shortly after the end of the last major ice age, over a period of 800 years, between 9300 BC and 8500 BC. Regardless of any notions or definitions of a Mesolithic period, the archaeological evidence refers to an ancient time when several generations of people occupied the site, perhaps during certain seasons of each year, or perhaps sporadically once every few years. Those ancient people clearly invested in occupying the site with at least one formal house structure and apparently a large timber platform at the edge of the lake. Those people hunted animals from the habitats at the edge of the lake itself and in the surrounding forests. The plant foods have been unclear in the local diet, but so far the absence of domesticated crops would suggest a reliance on wild plant foods in the natural forests, or perhaps a low intensity of management of those forests. In addition to the daily practicalities of the freshwater lake and access to basic dietary foods, the ancient people at Starkar have given us clues about their artistic expressions and ritual contexts. These aspects are reflected in the ornamental pendants and beads, as well as in the red deer frontlets. Based on the range of material findings at Starkar, how would you interpret the evidence? What additional evidence would you want to find in order to prove or disprove your interpretations? As always, thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.